I'm just tempted to say, praise the Lord and let's go home. I just got myself a blessing. I don't know about you. Sometimes we need a storm. We need a storm, and that storm has to show us where that hiding place is. And who is that hiding place, Sister Annette? Jesus Christ. The righteous run to his name and are saved. Can you say amen? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Wow, what a blessing. All righty. Well, talking to Pastor Bell the other day, uh, we talked about talking about the book of Revelation. So he, he started last week, I believe, with some t- thoughts on the book of Revelation and uh, the Sabbaths that I'll be here coming up. I'll also be expanding on that topic of the book of Revelation. So over some um, vegetarian food, we were talking about what type of message to bring as a foundational bedrock to understand the book of Revelation. And how about, how about the imagery of the sanctuary contained inside the book of Revelation. He said, I think that's a great idea. And so um, in your hearing this morning, we'll be talking about Jesus and his sanctuary, specifically in the book of Revelation. If you have a copy of the Bible, please open it with me to the book of Revelation chapter 1 and here verse 1. Revelation chapter 1 and here verse 1, the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation chapter 1, especially whose revelation is it? Some people think it's about the beast and 666. Others think it's about the seven last plagues and the the bowls of judgment. But the Bible tells us clearly the book of Revelation chapter 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God the Father gave him to show to his servants, the prophets, that which must quickly take place. And he sent it, signified it through his angel to his slave John. Now look at verse 3. The Bible has a special blessing for those studying verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads. Blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep what is written in it because the time is near. It's called the revelation of Jesus Christ. So whatever it is that we're going to learn in the book of Revelation these next couple of months with Pastor Bell, yours truly, maybe some of the elders also preaching under the the anointing of the Holy Ghost, it's going to help us see Jesus in a better, hopefully more clear light. It is the revelation of Jesus, meaning there was something that was once not revealed, but the time has come for men and women to know certain things about Jesus. Jesus, Bible says, what he's doing today up in the heavenly sanctuary, Hebrews 8, now the things which we've spoken, this is the sum, we have, you have, you have, you have, I have, something you possess, something that is yours Something that can change circumstances. We have a high priest. And it's not just any high priest. Excuse me, we don't want to boast, but excuse me if I do. We have such a high priest, praise the Lord, who is set at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens. And this high priest is a minister. Is the minister of the sanctuary. So he ministers to our needs through certain compartments and certain furnishings in the sanctuary. And he is the minister of that sanctuary, of that true tabernacle that the Lord himself pitched, not man. You see, when the Father and the Son got together in that holy council that they left Lucifer outside, They got together and they began to devise a plan. What would happen if mankind would rebel? And in the devising of that plan created before the foundation of the world, before he made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters, God already had a plan. And in that plan of salvation, he drew out that plan in a city. Specifically in a in a building called a temple, specifically in something called the sanctuary. 
And in that plan of salvation would be, well, the Bible says in the book of Psalms, how that uh, Psalm 77, thy way, O God, the way of understanding, the way of revelation, the way of relationship with God. If you want to know about God, if you want to follow his footprints, as it were, his way is found in the sanctuary. So to know the sanctuary is to know the author of the sanctuary. That's why in Exodus 25, 8, he says, let them make me a sanctum arum, a holy area. I will live with them. I will dwell among. How many of you would like to have God as your neighbor? <laughs> well, we had some people in the previous service. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> maybe not. Maybe not. Because some would love it, absolutely. But he's holy and pure and righteous. He's consuming fire. And so many of us have, like the people that lived out here in the days of Israel, in these carps and these tents, about 750,000 of them, 2.6, 2.8 million people. Sins were committed out here. God is holy here. A holy area is here. Sins that are committed there are brought in through the door by a little beast, a goat or a lamb. That beast would take the place of the sinner. It would be offered up by the, by the person who's guilty, and the priest would then, of course, take of the blood that was spilled upon the death of the beast, and they would go inside and wash their hands and feet, make sure they were clean, and go inside this tent called the tabernacle. Happened to be divided in two parts, the holy place and the most holy place. Let them make me a sanctuary. And then he says, when you do it, do it according to the model that I pitched, that I'm going to show you. And this model that he pitched actually starts Knowing the, 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 the north, south, east, and west. He says, when you come into the sanctuary, if we're going to have a relationship, you need to give your back to the east. To the rising of the sun. To uh, all those things that are extraneous to those things that are holy. The Bible says that there were 24 priests for the high priest, and they were worshiping the sun, and they gave the backs to the temple. And God said... Do you see this, O son of man? Is this a light thing to provoke me to anger? He wants God's people to give their back to the rising of the sun and to worship him. And as we worship him, we come in through the gate, the door. And then we find this altar of sacrifice like we saw a moment ago. This, this water basin a moment ago we saw. Then the, the tent divided in two places, the holy place and the most holy place. There was this curtain between them. It was this seven golden candlesticks, the menorah, altar of incense right before the, the uh, big uh, curtain. And then here to the north will be the uh, table of the showbread table. Once a year, the whole high priest would go into the Holy of Holies. And in there was the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord God with that big old covering called the mercy seat with two cherubim, one on each side. And then you take that lid off inside with the Ark of the Covenant it was the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Put the lid back on. The Shekinah glory of God would appear right there. And on the floor was a ceremonial law. And this sanctuary uh, depiction tells us four specific ministries of the Lord Jesus Christ. Specifically Christ, first and foremost, as one that became incarnate with us. So, so then Christ came down to this earth and he tabernacled among us. And we saw his glory like the glory of the only Son of God full of grace and Truth, First, uh, the book of John chapter 1 says. So Jesus lived among us like he would have lived with those people in the tents. He walked a mile in your shoes. Wow. So he is with us, Emmanuel, God with us. And then Christ, he becomes the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world and dies on the cross. Jesus Christ, of course, was baptized. This is his earthly ministry. And then he is now for us as our high priest, our representative in heaven. Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, the seven golden candlesticks represent the seven spirits of God uh, working through the seven candlesticks. We saw the churches. We'll see that in a moment. Then he is the bread of life. Jesus says, I'm the light of the world, the bread of life. And Jesus offers up our prayers with incense. Praise the Lord. With the incense of his own merits. And Jesus Christ became flesh. 
This curtain represents the curtain of his flesh, the book of Hebrews states. And of course, he is the author of the Ark of the Covenant. And of course, he is uh, enthroned among the cherubim. And this represents Christ's four ministries as um, incarnate with us, lamb, priest, and of course, then will be soon coming king. And that would be uh, for another topic. But when we look in the sanctuary, again, you come in as a priest through this first veil, left-hand side the menorah. Without it, there would be no light. This shed light to the bread, uh, the showbread table and the altar of incense. It would be smelling beautiful as, of course, the incense would be right here. It would go up, and then this veil of coverings of cherubim and so forth, and then right behind that, the Holy of Holies, and here's the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord our God. And this is important for us to know as we reviewed during the evangelistic crusade that we had here a few weeks ago. But it also shows another aspect. It shows also that Jesus' way, El Camino de Jesus, Jesus' way, he came from heaven to earth to show the way. From the earth to the cross, my sins to pay. From the frog cross to the grave, the grave to the sky. Oh, I lift your name. What? On high. We know that hymn. Amen. So he comes down from the ark, meaning the throne. He becomes flesh. He is filled with the Holy Ghost upon his anointing as Christus, Christ. He is the bread of life. He says, search ye the scriptures. In them they give testimony of me. He offered up prayers. Teach us, Lord, how to pray. He said, pray this way, our Father in heaven. He, he taught us all these things in a perfect life. And then Jesus is baptized, offers his perfect life on the cross as the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He's risen on the third day, goes back to heaven, and leaves the door open. Now that the door is open by his grace, now the spirit and the bride say come and those who want to come, come and drink of the water of life freely and we come in by giving our backs to the east. The world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind, the world behind me, the sun, paganism, the old man, all things become new. Can you say amen? We had some baptisms here a couple of weeks ago. You see those beautiful faces coming out in glory. That you bury the old, you come out new, but you got to give your back. Therefore, oh feet, mark your feet about faith. Praise the Lord. You may have loved that before, but Lord, make me hate those things. I once loved. And there's something called the Holy Ghost. God anoints you with the Holy Spirit. He begins to change your love, change your desire, and you begin to place your love and your desire upon the Lord. Hallelujah. First thing you do, you walk in through the name of Jesus. He says, I am the door. First thing we've got to do, first things first, we need to die. We can't experience all God has for us if we're half-baked, half-saved, half-committed. We got to go all in. And the Bible says this is a rational form of worship, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, to offer up our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. This is where we come to the Lord and say, Lord, let me identify myself with the power of your death. You, you walked, you walked with the cross and you fell a couple of times and I've walked with my cross and I've stumbled more than once upon my own disguise. But no more masks, Lord. Resurrect me. I want to identify myself with your death and so we die to ourselves. Jesus did not, he say, you must take up your cross and deny yourself and Follow me. Deny means to say no to yourself. No, no, no. No, no. No, no. Seven times saying no. I think it would be a good exercise to do. At least you tell your, your loved one, what are you doing in church today? Well, I said, myself, I said no to myself today. Why don't we say no to ourselves seven times right now? Ready? Say it with me. Ready? One, two, three. 
No, 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 no. You did something good today. You said no to yourself. Problem is, we want to say yes to ourselves when the things that we used to love kind of, you know, show their heads up again. But we got to say to those things, what? No! And then we say, yes, 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 yes. Seven times is a perfect number, you understand? Seven times yes, seven times no. The world behind me, the cross before me. We're entering in, we're dying with Christ. We're being baptized coming out of the water and coming out of the Spirit, being born again. And now we enter into a life of holiness all the time being saved. What saves us is the life of Jesus, not my life. What saves us is the blood of Jesus, not my tears. What saves us is the work of Christ, not my sweat. We remain saved in the person of Jesus Christ, and this is the believer's, the believer's way. Now we come in and we pray. And in the Holy Ghost, we read the word illuminated by the Holy Ghost. We live in the Holy Spirit. We identify our bodies with the divine nature. How do we do that? Second Peter says that then we have these, these beautiful, rich, precious promises of God by which we escape the world through lust. We escape the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the vainglory of life. We escape the, the world, the flesh, and the devil. We escape those things by the provisions of the precious promises when we sing, I'm standing on the promises of God. We're, we're taking God at his word and things are changing in our spiritual life, physical life, social life, economic life. Things change when we pray. Can you say amen? And this happens because of the promises of a God that cannot fail. And so when we're living in that, we understand thy way and my way, O Lord, are in the sanctuary. Of course, we finish with Christ placing his covenant inside of our hearts. Now, the book of Revelation has seven visions, seven specific visions, and each vision forms the full book of Revelation. It was given on the seventh day, the Sabbath has seven perfect visions. And right before each vision, there is a sanctuary scene. The seven visions are, in chapter 2 and 3, the seven churches. In chapters 6 through 8, the seven seals. In chapters 8 through 11, the seven trumpets. In chapter 15, the preparation for execution, which is called the seven bowls. And then comes execution. The next chapter, chapter 16, the last seven plagues. And then seven truths about Babylon and how her fall will be. And then finally, seven truths of the other bride. Not the harlot, but the bride of the Lamb, the new Jerusalem. And her victory. Seven sevens. Perfect book. But right before each one of these visions which is our subject this morning, there is an introductory sanctuary scene. And we're going to see different compartments and different specially furnishings of the sanctuary. And we want to, for the next few minutes, have this Bible study together. So I hope you brought your Bible. It may be on your lap. It may be on your cell phone. But let's start off with the first sanctuary scene, chapter 1, verse 9 through verse 20. Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, John, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation, kingdom, perseverance in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the God's word and the testimony about Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. That means the seventh day. That's the Sabbath. But by the way, I don't understand. He got seven sevens on the seventh day. Where does Sunday come in? I mean, just putting that, if you're watching this through the internet, just put that in the back of your mind. Have a Bible study on that. Okay, because everything's about the seventh, seventh, seventh. God loves seven. Put it that way. He loves seven. It's all over the place in the book of Revelation. It happens to be on the Lord's Day. I'm saying this because there's a translation, the Catholic Bible, that actually says, Domenica, from which we get Domingo from which we get 
Sunday. The translation says, I was in the Spirit on Sunday. The original says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Last time I checked, Mark 2 says, the Son of Man is still Lord of the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week. Just to put that in your remembrance, in your precious mind. Keep on reading. And this voice like a trumpet on the seventh day of the week, the Lord's day I heard, and it said, verse 11, write on a scroll what you see, and send to the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And I turned, I saw the voice that was speaking to me. When I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was one like unto the Son of Man, dressed in a long robe with golden sash wrapped about his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, like white as snow. His eyes like a fiery flame. His feet like fine bronze fired in a furnace. And his voice like the sound of cascading waters. In his right hand he had seven stars. And from his mouth proceeded like a sharp two-edged sword. His face was shining like the sun at midday. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man, and he laid his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first. I am the last. I am the living one. I was dead, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Therefore, write what you see, what it is, what has been, what will take place after this. The secret of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels or messengers of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. First message. The first message of this sanctuary scene takes place next to the menorah. Seven golden candlesticks. In fact, turn a page back. Revelation 1. Look at verse 4. Revelation 1.4. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from the one who is, who was, and who is coming from the seven spirits before his throne. Wow. So Jesus walking among the lampstands, the lampstands represent the seven spirits of God in and on the churches of God, and Christ has the right to walk in our midst as he is walking today, this morning, through the agency of the Holy Spirit. And it is Jesus Christ who holds in his right hand the leadership, the messengers of the church, because the devil hates Brother Jimmy in a very special way. He's a leader in the church. And Pastor Bell. And the leadership in this church. And every church. And that's why Christ has got you in his hand. How important is that? The Bible says that Christ, this first message, Christ before the message of the seven churches, Christ appears as the Alpha and the Omega, beginning and end. If you've ever suffered in having to bury someone, recently even because of COVID or an accident or a disease, Jesus promised, promised saying, I have the keys to hell and the grave. He says, do not fear. I am the first. I am the last. There's nothing you will ever go through that I will not be there with. I will be the fourth man in the fire. I will be the one that will shelter you when you're going through the waters, when you're going through the fires. I will be with you. This is the promise of, of the first promise, the first sanctuary scene right before the seven churches. And it means this, Jesus is the victor on earth. Because when he turned around, he was on earth. And there, that's when he saw Jesus walking among the seven golden candlesticks. We'll see the rest of the visions up in heaven in a moment. That your will be done on earth. Even as it is in heaven. God's will for your life will take place. We need to acknowledge it, embrace it, praise him for it. Thank him. We'll say like, like the book of Isaiah, your lines for my inheritance have fallen upon places that I really, really like. The house that I live, 
the car that I drive, the spouse that I have, the children that the Lord hath given me. Everything has come in at the right place at the right time because you have numbered my days and you will fulfill each and every one of them. It's about a relationship, not a religion, a relationship in the sanctuary with the Lord that loves you. And so this, this is a beautiful message. Christ is victor on earth. Can I hear an amen? Praise the Lord. Second one, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. This one is the sanctuary scene that happens right before the seals. So let's read this, and then there's several verses to read. Revelation 4, verse 1. And then verse 4, 8, 10. Just read them on the screen. Let's read together Revelation chapter 4. Let's look at this next sanctuary scene in the book of Revelation. Chapter 4, verse 1. After this, I looked, and there in heaven was an open door. Now we're going up to heaven, right? The first voice that I heard speaking to me like a trumpet, back in Revelation 1, now says, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. Verse 4. Around that throne were 24 thrones, and on that, the, around those thrones sat 24 elders dressed in white clothes with gold crowns on their heads. Verse 8. Each of the four living creatures had six wings. They were covered with eyes around and inside. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God, the Almighty who was and who is and who is coming. Uh, verse 11. Verse 11. But let's just, you know what? Yeah, it's verse 11. Our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power because you have created all things. And because of your will, they exist and were created. So this is here in, verse, in chapter 4. Jump over to chapter 5, 1 through 7. Then I saw on the right hand of the one seated on the throne a scroll with writing on the inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. I also saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll, break its seals? No one in heaven, no one on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or even to look at it. And I cried, and I cried because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or even look into it. Then one of the elders said unto me, Stop crying, look. The lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has been victorious so that he may open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw one like a slaughtered lamb standing between the throne and the four living creatures and the, among the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. And he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of the one seated on the throne. Verse 12. Verse 12. They said unto him with a loud voice. The lamb who was slaughtered is worthy to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth, under the earth, on the sea, and everything in them saying. Blessing and honor and glory, dominion to the one seated on the throne. And to the lamb forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Wow. A lot of sanctuary imagery. A lot. We have, in this case, we have a lamb that was killed, that was slaughtered. We have the throne of God, which is as if it were the uh, very um, Ark of the Covenant. Uh, we have an inauguration service. So that the moment that Jesus, as the Lamb, approaches the Father, takes the book, the moment he's about to open the first seal, seven eyes, seven horns, representing the seven spirits of God. And did you notice that at that moment of his inauguration were seven? Jesus lived with us for 40 days after he was resurrected. We saw him, over 500 people saw him for 40 days. And then he was taken away from us. He went back to heaven. And as he's going back to heaven, he was saying to his people in, in, in Acts 1, stay in Jerusalem until you receive power from the Holy Spirit to be my witnesses. And he goes up for 10 days. And on the 10th day, the day of Pentecost, the Spirit 
is sent from his inauguration down to his people. And the church began with the power of the early reign. The early reign starts the gospel moving out in the power of Pentecostal Holy Spirit dispersation. God will do the same thing right before the coming of Jesus Christ. We as his people are awaiting for the latter reign. When again from this lamb who's not a priest, but this inauguration of him taking off very close to taking off his priestly garbs before he puts on his kingly garbs, before he takes that, that moment, again a special dispensation of Holy Ghost power. The power of God upon the holy people of God will fall. And we will again, as in the early Christian church, now finish the work, cut it short in righteousness, and through the latter rain, all the harvest will be ripened. It will be a special threefold message that says, fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment is come. A message that says Babylon is fallen, is fallen. A message that says whoever worships or receives the mark of the beast in his hand or in his forehead will drink of the cup of the wine of the wrath of God poured without mixture. This threefold message swells up in a loud cry, come out of her, my people, and a great power from God shines upon the earth, and every decision at that moment is for eternity. At that moment, the door of grace will shut, and the voice will be heard. He that is filthy, continue being filthy. He that is righteous, continue to be being righteous. He that is, um, uh, um, wor uh, what is it? Holy, let continue being holy still. He that is unholy, continue being unholy still. It's over. This is the inauguration, and we'll look at the uh, final in a moment, but the inauguration, the church starts. Now the seals are beginning to be opened, and what is a seal to the book? And I'm sorry I have to use the industry in which I work, and I work in real estate. It's the title deed. Seven seals are used for a title deed to see who is the owner. Of, that, of, that, of those mansions that Christ has promised he's been preparing for us before the foundation of the world. It's the names of those on the title deed in the book of life who are saved and forever delivered. Question, my brother and sister, is your name in that book? You say, well, I don't know. Well, you should. Well, how do I get my name there? Well, you're here right now, so you might as well just get saved. Well, how do I get saved? You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You believe that what he's done for you is enough. You full, put all your trust in him and say, forgive me. Thank you. It's a transaction. You join him by the covenant. You join Christ by the covenant of which he is your guarantor. And once we have this transaction done, Jesus, the guarantor of the covenant, guarantees, if you believe, that salvation is ours through what he has done for and in us. This is now the second. Let's move on to the third here. Chapter, two verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 2. Revelation chapter 8, verse 2, the third scene. Chapter 8, verse 2. Then I saw the seven angels who stand in the presence of God. Seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel with a gold censer burner came and stood at the altar of incense. He was given a, a large amount of incense to offer with all the prayers of the saints on the golden altar in front of the throne. The smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up in the presence of God from the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer burner, filled it with fire from the altar, hurled it to the earth. There were thunders, rumblings, lightnings, and a great earthquake. Right before the trumpets, another sanctuary scene. Now we're standing at the altar of incense. And right there, before the presence of God, when we pray, we produce aroma. When you pray, do you know that? You produce something that God can literally smell and see. A smoke that ascends up from earth to the very presence of God, mingled with the very merits of Jesus Christ, presented by Jesus on your behalf, you have not 
because you ask not. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you for everyone, rich and poor, black and white, every color in between, male or female, gay or straight, everyone that comes to me, I will in no wise shut out. Wow. This is the gospel. It's a gospel that goes out to the world where sin abounds. It's a gospel that says where sin abounds, grace much more doth abound. It's the gospel that says that there's a Savior up in heaven that can save any sinner from any sin at any time. This is a Savior who is such a high priest. And he is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. This is the Savior. His name is Jesus. And he is in the intercession business. Whoever approaches God through his merits, Christ can save to the uttermost because it's not based on how good you are. It's based on how good he is. And last time I checked, he's pretty good. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So we, we have this faith. He's a victor on earth. He is the inaugurational priest. He is the intercessional priest. But then, then, whew, comes judgment. Brothers and sisters, he's not kidding. Really quick, 1119, Revelation 1119. What other sanctuary scene do we see here right before the bowls? The Bible says in the book of Revelation chapter 11, verse 19, God's sanctuary in heaven was open, and the ark of his covenant appeared in his sanctuary. There were lightnings and rumblings and thunders and earthquake and severe hail. The door has not closed yet completely. Christ is literally starting to take off his priestly garments and the voice is still going out of his people who have received his Pentecostal latter rain power saying to all men and women, fear God and give him glory. The hour of his judgment is come. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Don't worship the beast or its image or receive its mark on its forehead or in its hand. The moment for that is coming. Come out of her, my people, so that you be not participants of her sins and receive not of her plagues. Because they're coming. The plagues are coming as executionary judgment. Right now it's it's investigative. Right now, it's, it's starting to. we got to give our back to the world. You, we just can't be dabbling in what God has says. Don't! We're all in. This is, if you ever said, I'm going to get ready when the moment is coming, the moment's here. And we can't be saying, I'm going to start getting ready we got to be ready now. Because it's not just about saving my wife, my daughter, and myself. It's about being ready and going out to share with other people to get ready. He can only use those that are ready. Not who are getting ready. And how long does it take to get ready? You can go home today fully saved. Filled with the Holy Ghost. And ready now. Ready to share. Ready to give all in, all in. Because right now... It's investigatory. Right now, it's preparation for the judgment. But then comes chapter 15. Look at this. Whew. The next one, chapter 15, verse 5. 15, 5. Praise God, the store, door's still open, but look at this. And after this, I looked. Again, this is right before the seven plagues. After this, I looked. And the heavenly sanctuary. The tabernacle of the testimony was opened. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues, dressed in clean, bright linen, with gold sashes wrapped upon their chests. One of the four living creatures gave the seven angels seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And then the sanctuary was filled, brothers and sisters, filled with smoke 
from God's glory and from His power. And no one could enter inside the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. It's over. Door is shut. Either you're in or you're out. That's called the executory. Now it's the execution of the judgment. The cessation of the priestly ministry. So again, these are vivid images. And you may recall when Moses inaugurated the first uh, desert temple. And the glory of God came down from heaven and lit the fire on the altar. And lit the fire on the golden candlesticks. And remember Aaron's two boys? They were half drunk and they... Thought they were going to play a little, a little game and they were going to, they were going to, yeah, what happened? As they were going to try to change strange fire, fire came down from heaven, consumed them, left their clothes perfectly, didn't touch a clothes. Remember that? You don't touch God's fire. You, you're led by his fire. Your sin is consumed by his fire. But you don't touch what he's put and started and called holy. You don't do that. And so what we do here is we, we have all in respect because God is coming mad. Very mad. And you say, why is he mad? Look at all those kids dying out there in Ukraine. Look at 100,000 Americans dying every day because of fentanyl that, now, that the government is now legalizing. Lord Jesus... The leadership that we have today is an actual scourge and judgment of God on America. You can't script it any better. Praise the Lord, Jesus is coming. Every time there's a, a left turn up there in Washington, when should have been a right, I'm saying, thank you, Jesus. It's judgment's coming. I'm just going to do this. Have nothing to do with them. That's why we meet here in Moreno Valley, in all these Adventist churches. That's why we fellowship together, because we are coming together as the world is coming together, as we receive the Pentecostal latter rain, Holy Spirit power to finish the work in the power of His Holy Ghost and go home. That's what cessation means. It's finishing. Today the door is still open. Today, right now, anyone can be saved if they believe. But it's finishing. Revelation 19.10. My time is almost up. Revelation chapter 19. Let's just read verse 1 and 2 instead of all, all 10 verses. We'll see here the avenger. The original avenger. Jesus Christ. The Bible says in verse 1. Revelation 19 verse 1. Sanctuary scene number 5. After this I, I heard something like the voice of a vast multitude in heaven saying. Hallelujah. Well you know. Brothers and sisters, if they're saying it in heaven, who said we can't say that on earth? I, I heard a lot of amens, but I didn't hear hallelujah. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know who tried sucking out dry the, the, the spirit in the church. You can't raise a hand and say, Gloria a Dios y hallelujah. I don't know I, who did that. It wasn't Jesus. It wasn't none of the 24 elders. So, I mean, I, if they're saying hallelujah and praise the Lord and raising hands and throwing down crowns and singing with harps, well, I'd probably say a praise the Lord and hallelujah as well. Amen, Sister Annette? Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, now they're saying hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Salvation, glory, and power belong to our God because His judgments are true and righteous because He has judged the notorious whore, the prostitute, Babylon who corrupted the earth with her sexual immorality, and he has avenged the avenger, avenged the blood of his servants that was on her hands. A second time they said, hallelujah. I mean, the 24 hours, elders, verse 3, hallelujah, over and over and over and over. An exaltation that he has, he has avenged. Now, let me say this about avenging. Chapter 19, uh, or, or earlier, talks about the souls under the altar. And, and it says to God, how long, O Lord, will you not avenge our, our blood? And then his answer was, his answer was, 
until the number of the martyrs is fulfilled. There could be among us here men and women that will have to give their life and God will grant us a special grace at that moment. A grace that we've never known. A grace for that moment to give up our lives as well as a billion or more Christians have done already. You know that many have died as martyrs for the Lord Jesus. And did you know that it is reserved in the end of time by number for many more to die. So we do not need to fear because it is much better doing that to get the crown than to go through God's wrath mixed without mercy. Uh-uh. God grant us the grace to fill full our destinies. He will number our days and he will make us fulfill those number of days. But brethren, we will say with the saints, hallelujah and praise the Lord. The last scene, chapter 21, we'll finish with the seventh sanctuary scene in the book of Revelation. Verse 1 through 8, Revelation 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And the sea existed no longer. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling is with man. I like how he said he will move into the neighborhood. I like that responsive reading today. And he will live with them. And they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will exist no longer, nor grief, crying, pain will exist no longer because the previous things have passed away. Then one, the one seated on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. He also said, Write, because these words, you can bank on them. Take them to the bank. These words are faithful and true. And he said to me, it is finished. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the thirsty from the springs of water of life, water as a gift. The victor will inherit these things. And I will be his God. He will be my son. But the cowards, the unbelievers, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, all the liars, their share will be in the lake of fire that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second Brothers and sisters, what we have learned today, Christ, the revelation of Christ, his pictures at each different compartment, whether it be the menorah, the altar of incense, whether it be at the um, great and awesome Ark of the Covenant, Jesus Christ, who stands before the covenant, Jesus Christ is the guarantor. His life answers the demands of the law. On your behalf. You live as long as he lives. And if he is saved. You are saved. This is our faith. That we are saved by his life. And that we have such a high priest. That is touched with the feelings. Of our weaknesses. Of our infirmities. He's not mad at you. He is touched. And however he remains without sin. Therefore, the Bible says we can come boldly with confidence to the throne of grace. If you have sin, grace will be much bigger than sin. If you need mercy, that is God to hold back what you deserve, you'll find mercy. If you need grace, that is God to give you and me what we don't deserve and can never repay and to give it to us when we least deserve it. You will find grace to help in time of need. All he's asking is if if you hear him calling you, if you hear his knocking, let him in. Experience all he has for you today. Will you do that? Let's come together. Let's be upstanding as we finish now with our last hymn together. And uh, let's sing this.
as we march into the glories of the new Jerusalem, singing with all of our heart, marching to Zion with, with every footprint that we've done by God's holy grace carried. Those footprints are the, Jesus' own very, very footprints. Let's sing this with all of our heart, all of our joy. We'll finish with a final prayer.